Northern Day in. Welcome to Viking Superpowers. This channel started out as the Portal Superpowers and you'll find that all those videos there are really relevant and interesting to you. They follow the line of thinking that I bring to the Viking Superpowers channel. My name is David Lovegrove and I've had a lifelong interest in spirituality, the paranormal and human superpowers. It all started for me around about the age of 12 when I'd been thinking a lot about God. People used to talk about God more back then when I was a kid. I didn't really want to believe in God until I knew God was real. So I sat one day under my parents' lounge room table, went into a meditative state, which I'd sort of learnt from watching a ninja TV program called The Samurai. And I remember calming my breathing. I felt like I was slowing my heart. And I actually went into a quite a deep, no mindedness state and I was there for a long time but after a long period I suddenly felt a strong strong presence of God uh, what they call a numinous experience and I can only really describe it as a sort of a golden glowing bliss but from that moment on I knew God was real and I, I became a little Christian I was pretty keen and it it sort of it blessed and blighted my life in many ways people tend not to like it if you try to tell them what the truth is and of course I was enthusiastically telling people you know God's real and a lot of the kids I knew just said no that's baloney and I don't believe it anyway at 18 after I left school I became uh, a trainee nurse and working in a major hospital often came across um, disease and death and it was in that period that I had my first experiences of what are now called shared death experiences on two occasions. I had a strange experience when somebody died and my sister, who was also a nurse, related a story which for me is probably the first NDE near-death experience I've ever heard of about a bikey who died in her ward who just had a sudden heart attack. He was not an old guy. He's only probably 35 and he's quite a mean, unpleasant fellow. And then he told her that she brought him back. She she was giving him CPR and they managed to bring him back. And he told her this incredible story about coming out of his body, seeing her, her working on him, following our friend, another nurse who ran away to get what's called a crash trolley. What he saw happen to her and other things he told my sister. I'll tell you about that in another place. But... Those first experiences of this afterlife concept were new to me because I only really knew the typical religious view that there is a heaven, there's one life. If you do the right thing by your religion, then you get to go there and everyone else, their fate's not so great. I became a surfer very much, this is the late 70s, very much into the ideas of the counterculture. I consider myself half surfer, half hippie. Had long hair, bit of a beard, whatever I could grow back then. Went to live the idyllic lifestyle by the beach. Uh, I intended to eventually have my own property and have a wife and lots of little hippie kids and grow my own food and that sort of thing and surf. But I ended up getting extremely ill because I was eaten alive by mosquitoes and what we call midges here in Australia. And I got some kind of encephalitis type illness. Three days trapped in a combi van, no food or water. Nobody knew I was sick. Middle of summer, ended up having a pretty incredible experience going to a heavenly place. Managed to survive that. I came back and I became very Christian after that because that I'd, I'd sort of dropped right away from the Christian church, uh, you know, for a number of years, being a surfy and just preferring the beach on the weekends. And I pretty soon became essentially a lay pastor and I joined this group that just sort of miraculously appeared who were outreaching to the counterculture so essentially I was a missionary to the counterculture after a couple of years of that intensely studying the bible praying you know doing christian things a wonderful time in a lot of ways but the dogma and the belief system just sort of cracked apart for me and I couldn't really intellectually hold it up anymore. It didn't really make sense. So I just set off on a, on a new spiritual adventure. I ended up becoming an artist. I went to an intense art school for a number of years. Started practicing Chinese internal Kung Fu at the same time, which is not, a, not sort of fitness based, but 
mind consciousness based. I also started practicing Hatha Yoga, which is um, people often see it as a sort of a stretching thing, but it was a spiritual discipline. It was about stretching. It was quite intense, but it was also about stilling the mind, going into a meditative state. Very similar thing that I'd encountered in lots of other experiences in my life. After several years, a lot of things started to come together for me and I realized that there was a sense of a portal. That's why I called my previous channel The Portal Superpowers. There was a sense of a, a portal or a gate by which I was connecting to the great consciousness, whether it's of the universe, of the planet, of the sun, of other people. I don't know, but it was my small self connecting to the great self and it, it felt like it was around the back of my head and i learned of course that there's this uh, idea of chakras and particularly an idea called the crown chakra or the sahasra chakra i think that's the right way to say it the thousand petal lotus uh, considered that it's a, a consciousness energy portal that connects you to all the other chakras and connects you to the great consciousness so viking superpowers is about all this obviously it's not immediately obvious that uh, studying the vikings would bring you to this but uh, we'll get to that so besides these things i've talked about these spiritual quests I've, I've always been somebody who has a lot of interests and from my early teens in the the mid 70s i gained a passion for the viking age for reading Viking history, reading books about archaeology. I became very, very interested. And then when I left school, with my first job, I, um, I bought a Lingbophone Icelandic course and a book called Teach Yourself Icelandic. Teach Yourself Icelandic came first, and I remember opening the book and reading the introduction in a bookshop. The author basically said, somebody who speaks modern Icelandic has access to the old Norse sagas, the, the Viking Age sagas, can read them without any difficulty. And I just was instantly hooked. I thought, this is for me. I've got to learn Icelandic. So I, I literally started to learn Icelandic in 1976, long time ago. And I haven't studied full on over all those years, of course. But it's always been there. It's always ticked away. If you ask anybody who's known me for years and years, they always say, oh, how's the Icelandic going, Dave? It's just one of those, like some guy building an ark or something like that. I've always just ticked away, but I've had other interests, particularly UFOs, flying saucers, UAPs as they call them these days. What's called paleo contact has fascinated me since the 70s when I first read Eric von Daniken's books. Uh, must have been somebody in the school library who was into that because we had all his books there. I've sort of basically always thought it was just a cool subject. I, I've never been a true believer in flying saucers. I've never actually seen one. I might have encountered one when I was a child, and that's also a different story which I'll tell. It was always just a really interesting thing. And then in the country town where I live, we don't have good internet, or we didn't until about probably six or seven years ago. We got ourselves a house in a new suburb which had good internet, and I started watching a lot of YouTube. And then I discovered quite by accident Dr. Stephen Greer and his Serious Disclosure Project, in particular... A big series, I think it's like a hundred uh, interviews he, he did with people in the early 90s. And that really made me sit up and listen. Because they're all, you know, military people, old timers from Roswell, you know, people in charge of nuclear weapons and silos. But the two that really convinced me that this thing was real, this, this UFO flying saucer extraterrestrial or interdimensional um, visiting entities was real was two astronauts, Gordon Cooper and Edgar Mitchell from Apollo 14. So these were both heroes of mine when I was a little child, particularly Gordon Cooper. I actually remember him in the early 60s going up. It was always in the papers and in the 60s, children here in Australia, I'm sure children all over the world, avidly followed the doings of the astronauts they were our heroes from that point once i became convinced yes if all these people say it's real i believe it's real i started to take it much more seriously and it was around that time i saw a a film called push about these young people with paranormal powers extreme paranormal powers quite a cool exciting movie 
but you know fiction totally fiction this is on a dvd so at the end of the dvd there was a special which was called the science behind the fiction and uh, the director of the film the producer was talking to this guy colonel john b alexander now this guy's a fa fascinating man and as I watched this little documentary with my jaw dropped, uh, he he basically said, yes, it's all real. You know, the flying saucers, telepathy, remote viewing, telekinesis, moving things with your mind. We were studying this stuff back in the early 80s in the US Army. He also worked in the CIA and he's written a number of really good books. I'll put the links in the description below. But I was just amazed because... I'd experienced these things after, especially after that near-death experience in 1980. I experienced a lot of really very powerful things, and at the time, I thought of them as religious experiences, things you know that God caused. But as time went on, I thought maybe God's involved somehow. But this seems to be innate in me, and that other people also have this these sort of powers and experiences. I got to know uh, Colonel Alexander because I wanted to. I, I I remember saying to my wife, I would love to meet this guy. This guy's amazing. And then I met another amazing person, Lisa Smart, who was an associate of Dr. Raymond Moody, who I got to meet virtually, who are both experts in, in near-death experiences and researchers in that field. Lisa just happened to know Colonel Alexander, and I said, oh, could you introduce us? And she said, yeah, absolutely. So she introduced me to Colonel Alexander, he very graciously and kindly gave me a few interviews and we're still friends. We sort of write to each other back and forth at times and he just blew my mind with the stuff that he, he knew, the experiences he's had in a long life. He was represented by George Clooney in the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats, extremely loosely based on his story, very fictionalised but a pretty cool movie in itself, inspiring sort of movie. I discovered writers and researchers who I now consider legends, uh, Paul Anthony Wallace, a fellow Australian, and Mauro Biglino, two gentlemen with incredible backgrounds in the scriptures, you know, the study of theology and religion. Paul Anthony Wallace was a Church of England priest for 33 years. Uh, he used to teach the Bible, teach Genesis to other, other ministers and priests. Is an experiencer himself. He's got a fantastically interesting story. And Mauro Biglino was one of the world's great authorities on ancient Hebrew. And he worked for the Vatican and translated, I think, 12 books out of Hebrew into Italian. And he and Paul have done quite a bit together. They're both associates with Eric von Daniken and a number of other luminaries around the world who are doing some very interesting things that are also written off as pseudoscience, pseudo-archaeology, pseudo-history and this sort of thing, which is sort of typical. That's why I was so thrilled when I, I realised that flying saucers appeared to be real and these unusual paranormal psychic abilities are really real. I realise also these debunkers and sceptics, they're real too, but what's their agenda? You know, what's what's really going on. I, I, I think a lot of them are terrified of this stuff, that if it is real, it throws their whole world into a huge spin. Others, I think, are actually sort of paid to debunk it, paid to suppress this stuff. But that's for another day. When I was sort of, well, the whole family and the whole area and the whole world was hit by the COVID lockdowns, I'd been getting into all these things and I'd started to really pursue my Icelandic studies again and I said to my wife I'm going to spend this lockdown time really seriously studying Icelandic you know because I can't go out and work I can't do all sorts of things so I'm just going to do it every day and that's what I did and as I did that I also started to pour over Icelandic and Old Norse I found online the little bit I had in in my book collection which I'd collected over you know almost 50 years probably about 60 books on the Vikings. And that's quite a library by most, most standards pre-internet. It was really hard to find stuff. And I'd collected all these wonderful books. And I started to sort of realize that in a strange way, all these things were connected. I started to find paranormal stories, which I guess I'd always known were there in the sagas, but 
I started to notice them and it was particularly because of Paul's work, Paul Anthony Wallace, the way he thought, the way he looked at the Bible books and the way he retranslated words like heaven and God and, you know, all sorts of things that people take for granted that had been actually translated in fairly disingenuous, maybe even dishonest ways. I started to see this in the, the Old Norse and then I came across a book by an Icelandic professor, Armin Jakobsson. This incredible man is a professor, he's the professor of early medieval literature at the University of Iceland. Really knows his stuff. I mean, anybody who's anybody in the field of Norse studies knows him. Yet I was surprised to find that he'd written this book called The Troll Inside You, Paranormal Activity in the Medieval North. I thought, wow, a professor is writing this about the paranormal and specifically about the Viking Age. And his, this book, The Troll Inside You, it's really mind expanding. And I, I read it pretty regularly because it's so deep. He's a very deep thinker, a terrific writer. His English is probably better than mine. He's obviously a born and bred Icelander, so he's, he's all over that and Old Norse. And I started corresponding with him. You know, he's, he's a really nice man and I didn't know if I'd get through to him, but he wrote back a great letter and he found me interesting and I, I told him honestly what I'm into and that didn't throw him. He said, yeah, this is interesting. And he had a lot to tell me, a lot of guidance that he gave me. And because of that, I started to really have a look at uh, the major books of the Viking Age mythology namely the two Eddas, the uh, Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. Prose Edda, written by Snorri Sturluson. Poetic Edda's more ancient works that Snorri uses as a source, um, ancient poetry preserved probably since the Viking Age, but both, both books in their own ways telling the ancient stories about the Viking gods and the exploits and how poetry is written. The other thing I looked into was the, the history of the Norse kings, which is called we call it Hames Kringla, which means the round world. It's just massive work. There's like Hames Kringla here's three big volumes tracing the the histories of the Norse kings from the ancient, perhaps mythical days right through to close to Snorri's time and Snorri was writing these books in the early twelve hundreds in Iceland. So this was all very exciting for me and I realised that I'd never really been that interested in the Viking myths. I knew them, of course, because I'd been obsessed with the Viking Age for so long. I used to read that, but to tell the truth, because of my Christian days and having really wanted to get away from religion, I was not that interested in joining another religion. I had lots of friends who are also true, which is, you know, the true believers in, in the Aesir, and I know that's pretty deep. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but uh, very, very interesting people, smart people. Always enjoyed their company because I just enjoyed anyone who was right into the Vikings. You know, it's not that super common. I suppose now it's much more common because of the Vikings becoming sexy again with all these cool TV shows with Ragnar and other related things in the Marvel Universe with all their Thor and Odin and Loki and Asgard. But I wasn't drawn to worship Norse gods as much as I consider myself, you know, in my dreams, a Viking, you know, I'm, I'm very much into it. And I relate to that. It's, it's my ancestry is from, you know, Scotland and the highlands of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and probably, you know, a fair bit of ancestry coming from the Scandinavian countries. Then a miracle happened. A good friend of mine, Simi Valgiarsson, who's a, president of the Australian Icelandic Association, he rang me and said the family of an old Norse scholar who passed away several years ago has his personal old Norse library and they've tried the different universities who've rejected the library and they've reached a stage where they might have to just dump these books. And I went, wait a minute, dump? How many books are we talking about? So he sent me a list and it was like 200 books and it was just an absolute dream list. Like if I had sat down and thought, 
what would be my ultimate collection if I could have it somehow magically. It was this. It was all, all this. You know, the whole... Well, it's not the whole Islands fawn, fawn writ, but it's a heck of a lot of them. And these are all the um, Fornalda saga. They're sort of so-called mythical sagas. I'm going to be getting right into translating them. I'm sure they're absolute treasure houses of interesting stuff. Uh, Islandinga Theiter and Islandinga Sagar and just lots of other books. Heaps of books, all the sagas there. Lots of sagas in English. But the great value of this is all the Icelandic. It's like Old Norse and modern Icelandic scholarship. There's so much scholarship hidden in the Icelandic and there's not that many people outside of Iceland who can read Icelandic. That was a miracle. You know, for me, to inherit that, it felt like the gods were with me, literally. As I sort of got more and more deeply into this, I became intrigued with this idea of not just human paranormal abilities, which are incredibly interesting in the sagas and why these things weren't more well known and obviously a part of that is that it's all denied in our culture it's denied that this is real you know just ted talks about how it's not real wikipedia says it's all not real it's pseudoscience it's all charlatanry and stuff that i've experienced all my life they tell me nah it's not real I mean, yeah well it was, it is, but people are welcome to their views. So what I found in the sagas was not just these paranormal superpowers, but these gods who in some places seemed like true mythical, you know, supernatural, spiritual gods. In other places seemed very mortal, very human, yet at the same time not normal humans they were described as being incredibly beautiful talented they you could mate with them they were said to have bred with families and people all over the north seeded their genetics amongst you know thousands and thousands yeah you know, many many of them and they're called the Aesir and that word itself it's not absolutely known what that means but that word seems to mean well Snorri says it means you know the men of Asia that they came from Asia Minor, around Troy. And that's, I'm getting into that in my next video, who these people were. But there's this whole incredible story, and it seems like there's the gods that the Germanic peoples worship right back, you know, BC, that represented, you know, the powers of nature, that represented deep spiritual experiences, and then there's these others. And so I'm researching all of it. I'm researching what I consider paleo contact, a whole amazing hidden story about people from somewhere else with incredible high tech coming here, coming to the earth, manipulating our genetics, breeding with us, doing amazing things and teaching how to be magic. You know, how to be a wizard, how to be a magical person. And I, I personally believe that a lot of what we consider, you know, just ancient mysteries could have come from these people like yoga. You know, anybody who's practiced yoga at a deep level knows it's pretty wonderful. And you think, wow, who, who worked this out? Probably just people, but could have been people who were something else. And I'm not really a true believer in anything i always keep an open mind and i like the extraterrestrial hypothesis but i'm also open to the fact that maybe these were humans from a much more ancient age who'd gone off world gone out into the galaxy met other civilizations gained from their technology gained spiritually from them came back here some of them came back here some of the ways they behave you might think well they're certainly not saints <laughs> But that's a certain idea of what, what things are supposed to be like. But anyway, I, you know, my thing is to present to you and to, to talk back and forth with you, comment um, on this 
amazing ancient indigenous wisdom from the north that was such a hugely affecting thing that got terribly violently suppressed and fought against and eventually caused to go underground and supposedly lost but that it's still there and I believe a lot of people are now refinding it in a way where we're not suppressed in it's not suppressed we're not being held back from talking about this there's a period where for me to talk about this the way I'm doing would have been seen as somehow spiritually evil and I know that there's people who you know they just don't like their religion or their way of thinking question they think anybody who does that must be evil because they got very black and white minds but I believe in science in the truest sense science not just of the physical world but the spiritual consciousness world uh, the mysterious and I know it's a bit of a cliche but the quantum world where everything appears to be consciousness anyway I'll leave it at that that's what Viking superpowers is about I'd like to thank all those cool people who've written to me already I'm, I'm particularly thrilled that I've got quite a number of Scandinavians and and uh, Frisians and Dutch guys and ladies writing to me, giving me tips, encouraging me, saying, cool, we can't wait to see what you do next. You know, that's really cool for me. But whoever you are, please um, subscribe. Please keep coming back. I assure you I've got a lot of stories to tell. And I'm writing my first book, Viking Superpowers, which will be about things that I talk about in my videos, but a lot more as well. So see you later. Have a great week. And bye-bye.